right, I'm just going to use this microphone. There we go. All right, let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. All right. Um, well, I, I've been asked uh, to tell you just a little bit about my story this morning, and I'll, I'll be brief. Is that all right? That never works. I, I say that's very rare that I'm brief. If my wife were here, she'd be laughing. Um, well, the, the first thing I want to begin by saying is that every one of us has a story. And when I first became a believer, what do you want me to do? Yeah, I'll do my best. Um, when I first became a believer, um, one of the things that happened that I think in some ways wasn't, wasn't the healthiest thing that ever could have happened to me um, was that once people sort of heard about, you know, my story and they'd heard me speak maybe a couple times, uh, there, there was a lot of emphasis on, on asking me to come to speak at academies and, and other places where there were youth events because at that time I was a young man, just 24 years young. And uh, the word on the street was that I'd been a professional skateboarder and that I'd done a number of things that the youth sort of maybe aspired to. And, and I think to some degree, well-meaning academy principals and others, they thought, oh, we need to get this guy over because he'll really resonate with our youth. And um, to some degree, I think that was certainly the case. The, judging by the number of invitations that I received early, I mean, we're talking like within months of my conversion, and this took place over probably the first five years of my life, up until I was almost 30 years old. Lots of invitations, and those invitations, uh, especially to young people, would invariably center around my testimony, my experience. And uh, yet the remarkable thing was something about the way that I was telling my testimony or something about the way that the young people and others were hearing it was that almost without exception, when I would get done telling the story, people would come up and ask me lots of questions about my past life. You follow that? As if, as if that was the point. And uh, so actually, I, I spent a number of years sort of thinking about this, and I took a hiatus. That means I took a break. It's a fancy word for a break. It makes me sound smarter. I took a hiatus um, from telling my testimony for about three years because I thought, man, every time I tell this story, it just comes off as a little too sensational, a little too awesome. I end up looking a little too good. And the young people just think, oh, this guy's a little cooler than he is. And my wife's sitting there saying, you're not half as cool as you think you are, you know? <laughs> and, um, and I think it's funny because as I've come into the Seventh-day Adventist church and as I've come into Christianity, I've noticed what I consider to be an unhealthy pattern. And uh, that pattern is that we tend to overemphasize, not just emphasize, but overemphasize those testimonies that we take to be as particularly amazing, right? The richest caveman, wow, what a story. And of course it is a great story. Doug's a friend and it's a great story. But the problem is, is that we, we unwittingly create a situation in which we are subtly, if unwittingly, communicating that if your testimony doesn't look quite like that, from gangster to God, right? From rock and roll to the rock of ages, from Hollywood to the Holy Word, right? What are we saying? Well, unwittingly, what we are effectively saying to the young people in particular, and what they're often picking up is, is that if you don't have a story like that, you don't really have a story. Are you with me? And so I took some time away and I thought, man, wh why when I tell my story do I always have to, why does it have to be so amazing and so astonishing? And the part that was most damning to me I'm being a little vulnerable with you here this morning. Maybe it's because I didn't get enough sleep. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I think the part that was most damning is that in those early days of telling my testimony, uh, the emphasis was on what I had given up to become a Christian. Oh, I was a professional skateboarder, and I played in bands, and we had records and, and uh, contracts, and, but I gave it all up for Jesus, right? And people were impressed with that. I myself for a time, was fairly impressed with it. And then I reflected and I thought, what really have you given up? And the answer is, nothing worth keeping. There's this book, this great book that I read every year, and I recommend the same practice to you. In fact, I've recently modified that to be not every year, but I want to read this book every month of my life for the rest of my life. 
And that's a little book. It's easy to read. It only takes me about an hour and a half because I know it so well. It's called Steps to Christ. And uh, it's just about a hundred and some pages. Very small book, very short book. You can read it in an afternoon. And I used to say, I'm reading this book every year. But then I found it wasn't often enough. So I'm going to try this every month thing. That's a decision I've just made recently. And there's this great statement in there where the author, Ellen White, says, but what do we give up when we give up all? And she says, a sin-polluted heart for Jesus to cleanse and purify by his own blood. <laughs> right? And it was just like, wow, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And so as I mentioned, sounding quite intelligent, I took a hiatus from telling my testimony. I just took a break. I said, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop telling my story, and I'm going to start telling the story of Jesus. And then after a little while, I came back, and I said, okay, I can tell my story again, because now I'm married, I have a child, I, I, I live with a person who is wonderful, godly, spiritual, beautiful, and who doesn't mind telling me that I'm not as cool as I think I am. So I think I was sufficiently humbled by that point to not, not be too impressed with myself, right? Like Paul says in the New Testament, that... Uh, if you think you're something, be careful, right? Be careful lest you fall. Well, so here's the story, and here's the story with all of the uncoolness wrapped around it, okay? Uh, when I first told the story, it used to sort of center around skateboarding and, and being a musician and being in bands and, and that sort of thing. But now that I'm older, I'm 42, halfway dead, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> halfway dead. You hear that over there? You're going to blink and be 42. Look at all those teenagers sitting over there feeling invincible, thinking, thinking gray hair will never come. <laughs> Every one of you is tested old age positive. It's going to come. <laughs> I'm telling you, am I wrong or am I right? How many of you, I mean, I saw this quotation recently, and it said, one day you're going to wake up, you're going to look in the mirror, feel like you're 18, look like you're 60, and say, what happened? Am I wrong or am I right? One of my church members, a, a, a guy by the name of Milton Edwards, 94 years young, swims every day, just retired from being a builder at the age of 88, and I had dinner with he and his wife, Betty. They're two of my best church members, and I said, Milton, I got a question for you. You're 94 years young. You're fit as a fiddle. Your mind is intact. At what point did you start feeling like an old man? Oh, I loved his answer. It gave me such hope. He said, hadn't happened yet. <laughs> Still waiting for that. Right? So here I am, 42 years young, with a slightly more mature perspective, I think. I was born in the great state of Wyoming. Anybody else here from Wyoming? All right, that's the salt of the earth right there. I was born in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and my, my grandfather used to say that, because uh, it was really cold. I mean, this is like a warm summer day you know, in Wyoming. Um, it gets really cold there, and when I was born in Cheyenne, the elevation is just over 5,000 feet, so it's bitter cold, and uh, my grandfather used to remark that the cold and the wind kept the riffraff out, and I would say, well, you're still here. <laughs> so I was born in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Little did I know on that day, August 16th, 1972, that just about 23 years later, in October of 1996, I would be born again also in Wyoming, about 45 miles down the road at a town called Laramie, where the University of Wyoming is. But the story between my birth and my rebirth is an interesting one, and it revolves in, upon uh, more mature reflection, I think, on the fact that I, I never had a father figure in my life. Um, that is the story increasingly in the world in which we live. I was just visiting with some young people out the back um, the, last night, last night. And I was telling them an interesting statistic, and I think you'll find this fascinating. Let me ask you. How many of you were alive in 1960? Okay, I'm going to keep my hand down on that one. What do you think the percentage of people that were married between the ages of 18 and 29? Okay, 18 and 29, the percentage of people that were married in 1960. What do you think it was? 80%? That's a little high. 70%. 70% of people in the United States ages 18 to 29 in 1960 were married. Guess what that percentage is today? 20%. 20%. The world has changed. Am I wrong or am I right? It's changed radically. And the story of absentee fathers is increasingly the story of young people, both men and both girls and boys. 
right? Of We have lots of people that have the machinery to be a dad. They have the plumbing to be a dad, but they don't have the heart to be a father. And there's a difference. My mother was quite young when she became pregnant with my father. He was a teenager. She was a teenager. And when I was born, he stuck around for about three weeks, right? When I've seen pictures of my mom, she was hot. She was beautiful. I mean, I, I, I myself would have been interested in my mom if I had lived back in those days. I'm like, Mom, you were hot. And so what Frank Cross, that was his name, Frank Cross. I was born David Cross. Man, I kind of wish that was still my name. What a great name for a preacher. And our speaker this afternoon is David Cross. You know, I have to put up with people saying asterisk and ascherik and asherik, and I'm just like, oh, man, give me cross, right? But anyway, I was born David Cross, and Frank stuck around for about three weeks, but he was interested in a beautiful, young 18-year-old, not in a crying, pooping, whining child. And so, like so many dads, not fathers, he stuck around. He was effectively a sperm donor in my life. That was the beginning and the end of my relationship with him. Well, my mother, um, being young and being vulnerable, not really being able to take care of me, I spent most of my young years with my grandparents. I was raised in no small degree uh, up until the time I was a teenager by my grandparents, Rita and Oak Atkins. What a great name for a grandpa, Oak. <laughs> and he was just exactly like that. I mean, he was Wyoming, born and bred. He was a farmer. He worked on the Union Pacific Railroad. He was a man's man, and he was one of the best men I ever knew. He was kind. He was gracious. He came from a large family. And when his teenage daughter became pregnant, he certainly wasn't pleased about that. You can just imagine in those days what that looked like, especially when the marriage fell apart. My grandfather actually got Frank a job at the Union Pacific Railroad, a job that he holds to this day. Fascinating. Well, when I was then, I, my mom decided that she wanted to become a nurse, and so she was going to nursing school. And uh, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents, Rita and Oak, and I just grew up thinking that that was normal. Gr being raised by your grandparents is the normal thing. There's probably people here who had a similar experience. Your grandparents played a formative and determinative role in your life, and I tell you, I, I love that. Um, the downside, of course, was that there wasn't a major father figure in my life, but my mother did remarry. She remarried a guy by the name of Glenn. And uh, she was married to him for about seven years, and that didn't work out so well for me because in the classic scenario, I was the stepchild, right? I was somebody else's child, and uh, not long after uh, Glenn married my mother, they had a, a, they had a child, my younger brother. It's different dad, same mom. And I say the, the only good thing that came out of that marriage was my brother. I call him my little brother, but he's really tall. He's taller than me, he's more handsome than me, and he's funnier than me. So this is really a, this is a burden for me to bear, right? <clears throat> Particularly in high school. Listen to this, those of you that are teenagers over there. My girlfriends in high school would, would, would without exception, comment on how good-looking my younger brother was. I mean, that's just, that is absolutely deflating. Right? Be like, oh, yeah, this is my younger brother, Rob. Oh, he's really good-looking. Well, thank you for that. <clears throat> and by the time he was 14, he was taller than his 17-year-old brother, more muscular. So, that, I mean, the whole social dynamic got really weird when your younger brother can beat you up. And he's funnier and more handsome. But anyway, we're close as can be today, and I absolutely love him. But then my mother sort of was, was single again for a while, and I spent much of that time, again, being raised by my grandparents in and around Wyoming. Well, at that time, a remarkable thing happened. My mom met a guy who was the first man that ever treated my mother the way that she deserved to be treated. And uh, she, she's a great woman. She's, she just made a couple of bad mistakes. There's a lot of great women that make some bad choices. And uh, I love to tell people that God hates divorce, but he loves divorcees. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? And uh, my, my mom got off to a bit of a rough start, but she, she met a guy who walked in, true story, Richard Lane Asherick walked in to a place called the Hitching Post. It was a dance club in Cheyenne. And uh, when she walked in, my, the man that would become my father, whose namesake I would voluntarily take, and that's where I'm going here in just a minute. I would have been almost 13 years old at this time, and when my mother walked in, my dad insists today, I call him my dad, I call him my father, because he earned that right. Uh, she, he saw her walk in, and he purportedly turned to his friend and said, 
that is the woman I'm going to marry. Now, remarkably, six weeks later, it happened. That is not a recipe for success. It's not a recipe for success, but nearly 30 years later, they remain happily married, absolutely committed. And I tell you, one of the greatest things that ever happened in my life was the day that my mom met Richard Asherick. And uh, here's why it was so amazing. This guy came to the table with a woman that by the society standards, by many standards, was damaged goods, right? She had two children from two marriages. But this man, let me tell you about this man. This man never treated us like anything other than his own children, right? And my mother, because I'd already had the last name Cross, and then because I was so young when my mother remarried the second time, I took on my second father's last name. So I got most of you ladies beat. I've had three last names, <laughs> right? I took on a second last name, Dormany, D-O-R-M-I-N-E-Y, David Dormany. I was David Dormany for about 10 years of my life, a little more than. And uh, after my mother remarried the third time and met this amazing man who was an officer in the United States Air Force, he would spend 36 years in the Air Force. And while he wasn't what I would call, um, he certainly wasn't an evangelical Christian. He was a Catholic Christian, Catholic believer. And my mom was a, was a recovering Baptist. And so my parents, I like to tell people that my parents did the logical thing. When a Catholic and a Baptist marry, they become Episcopalian. And I was married, I was raised in an Episcopalian context and in an Episcopalian situation. But Richard Asherick, I tell you, this man was a gentleman and an officer and, and a, just a saint. Because he took my brother Robert and myself under his arm and he loved us and he treated us as if we were his from day one. I'm going to see him tomorrow. I can't wait. I'm flying out to Wyoming tomorrow. I'm going to go spend some time with my mom and my dad. I'm so excited before I return to the great island continent of Australia. Well, here's the fascinating thing. Mom came to myself, my brother and I. By this time, we were old enough to understand that we'd been ditched twice, right? And, and when my second father left, it was actually more painful than when the first one left because I'd never met my first dad. He was just an anomaly. I mean, he was nothing to me. He was a ghost. But for my brother, it was much harder because he was about eight years old when our second father left, and he knew his dad. I remember when my two boys were eight and seven, I was looking at them, and I was thinking, what would happen to little Landon and little Jabel, the names of my two boys, if I just left right now? I mean, this is the age that my younger brother was when, when, when his father just walked out. It was far more painful for him. I never really felt rejected because I never knew my dad, and I, I could understand. He was a teenager, right? He just made a mistake. Um, but this was a different situation, right? You have a child for six, seven, eight years, and then you, you leave. Well, Richard, man, he just... He just picked up the mantle of fatherhood, and he raised my, myself and my brother like we were his own. And here's the coolest thing. My mother came to me and she said, I'm not going to ask you to be adopted again. That'll be your own choice. Right? That's a choice you're going to make. At this point, I was David Dormany. My brother was Robert Dormany. And we were old enough to know better. And after a year of spending time with this guy, and we saw the way that Richard treated my mom, we saw the way that he treated us. The most remarkable thing happened. I was sitting in my room one day thinking about this guy. I didn't quite know what to call him. What do you call him? I was, you can't really call him dad, right? But I, I can't call him Richard because he's from an old school Louisiana home. And you don't call adults by their first name. Right? It just doesn't happen. So like, I'm like, I'm calling this guy that lives in my home that acts like my dad, Mr. Asherick. Right? But the problem is I really like him, and he's, he's the first real father figure I've had. And so I made up my mind, my 13-year-old mind, and I walked down the hallway to go to my, the room of my 10-year-old brother, and I walked in the room and I said, Rob, I got something to tell you. And he's, he just looked at me, I'll remember, I, I just remember this like it was yesterday. He said, let's get adopted. And I, I said, are you kidding? That's the, that's the very thing I came in to tell you. I came in to tell you that he's like, yeah, I've been thinking about it too. What a remarkable little providence. What a, what a little wink from God to say, hey, you're on the right track here. And so my brother and I, we made our own decision to be adopted. And what I love about that is that years later when I would come to the biblical text, I would come across these passages that would talk about you are adopted. The spirit of adoption has been given to believers. And then it says when the spirit of adoption comes into our hearts, we cry out, and then there's this word, Abba, which is a great word. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a colloquial word. It's like daddy, 
My boys didn't call me daddy, they called me papa, because I always thought that sounded really cool. So I'm papa, because I just liked that, right? And, and, and so it's like when the spirit of adoption, Paul says, comes into our heart, we cry out, papa, daddy, right? Whatever you called your father figure, if you had one, and if you were lucky enough to have one, you were blessed. Let me tell you that, you were blessed. It's so funny, my wife, we both come from similar families. She has two brothers and two sisters. I have two brothers and two sisters. And her family seems so weird to me because all of the brothers and sisters are related. How weird is that? <laughs> and she has the same mom and the same dad as all of her brothers and sisters. And I look at her family, I'm like, your family is so weird. Right? But of course, her family is normal. But normalcy is a product of comparison. My family feels really normal to me, even though I have two brothers and two sisters and one of them's black. Right after my mom and my dad got together, she couldn't have children anymore, and so they said, we want to adopt the young girl. And they adopted a beautiful young African-American girl, Elizabeth. And uh, she came into our lives seven years young, one of the seven years younger than me, one of the best things that ever happened to me because it brought diversity into my life. It brought variety into my life. It brought beauty into my I love this girl. I get to see her hopefully tomorrow. She's studying right now, but she lives in Denver. And uh, it's really fun when I introduce people. I'll be like, this is my sister. And they're like, in Christ, I'm like, no, just my sister. And they're like, could we see a picture of your parents? We'd really like to see a picture of your parents. See, I made the decision to be adopted, and you too can make the decision to be adopted. You see, we don't choose our birth parents, but we can choose our adoptive father, and that's God in heaven. Now, I want to close by telling you this remarkable story. This is almost impossible to believe, but I'm telling you the truth. After I became a believer at the age of 23, I was studying medicine at the University of Wyoming. And uh, at that point, I was a skateboarder and a punk rocker and what's called a vegan. You know what a vegan is? The first time I ever went to Norway, I love telling this little story. First time I ever went to Norway, these people kept coming up to me and asking me if I was a vegan. And I thought that was like a variation of Norwegian. So I would say, no, no, I'm American. <laughs> oh, excuse me, are you a vegan? Oh, no, no, I'm American. And they would always give me the strangest look. The strangest look. Well, about three days later, the penny dropped when a dear sister came up to me at this invitation that I was speaking at, and she said, are you a vegan or a vegetarian? <laughs> she said, because I am the only vegan in my village. <laughs> and I suddenly realized, whoa! What people have been asking me is if I was a vegan. How funny does that sound? Are you a vegan? No, I'm an American. <laughs> Not far from the truth, really. So I was a purple-haired, skateboarding, punk rock vegan. And these really weird people opened up a restaurant in my town. And when I say weird, at this time I had tattoos, purple hair, no hair. I mean, I was with my whole cadre of punk rock friends. You know, we were quite a crew. And uh, yet we thought these people were weird because the girls all wore these long potato sack looking dresses and the guys without exception were wearing suspenders and invariably they would call everybody brother and sister. And when we, when we would start to patronize the place because it was, it was um, a vegetarian restaurant, a vegan restaurant, we were vegans, not for health purposes, but for animal rights purposes. I was a strong, socially conscious vegan. I wouldn't eat honey, I wouldn't wear leather shoes, I wouldn't ride in a car with leather seats, I'm telling you the truth. I was a strong, socially conscious vegan. And uh, these people opened up this vegan restaurant in our town and we started going there, and lo and behold, we came to find that these people were these really weird, wild, crazy, but fantastically friendly people called Seventh-day Adventists, right? And we got to know them. And uh, we began, uh, my friends and I, and we would ask questions about their religion, and why do you do that, and why do you say that, and why, why can't you just call me David? Why does it have to be Brother David? <laughs> oh, because you're our brother in Christ. All right. <laughs> Give me the salad, you know? It's just like, 
These people were so wholesome, they were lifted out of a Laura Ingalls Wilder book and dropped <laughs> into, I'm telling you, they were straight, they, were, they came from Pennsylvania. I mean, these people were just Amish. They were, they, were, they were just so wholesome and so friendly and so kind and so wholesome, right? And it, it, they were just wonderful and beautiful. And over about a year, these people slowly began to win the hearts of me and my cadre of punk rock friends. Well, to fast forward the story, they gave me a book, a book you might have heard of, called The Great Controversy. And I took that book totally out of politeness, totally out of courtesy. I had no intentions of reading that book. It went on the shelf, the bottom shelf, where I planned for it to stay f perpetually. But in a series of circuitous and sad events, uh, and it, it, and a situation came into my life about a year after I'd received the book, and I, I picked it up and I began to read it, and that led me to Scripture, which led me to Jesus, which brought about my conversion. And I used to love the way that Mary and Tom would say it. They were the owners of the restaurant, two beautiful people. They would say, oh, we loved him into the message. <laughs> oh, that's exactly how it should be. They, they didn't preach me in. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't, you know, scare me in. They just loved me into the message. And here's a little remarkable side story. Not only myself, but there was about 10 of us from our little punk rock community that decided to become followers of Jesus and join the Seventh-day Adventist church. And today, five of us are Seventh-day Adventist ministers, <laughs> if you can believe it, from the same group of friends from the same little town that all went to the same vegetarian restaurant, five of us are Seventh-day Adventist ministers today. Isn't that absolutely remarkable? <laughs> Beautiful. One of them is my best friend. Uh, his name is Nathan Renner, pastors a church in Sonora, California, and a number of years ago, somebody heard about our story, and they said, we want to write your story up as a book, and so you can actually get that book. It's called Twice Upon a Time, if you want the full version, Twice Upon a Time. It's a great little story about myself and Nathan. Well, anyway, this is the story I was going to tell you. i got three minutes to do it. When my grandfather passed, it was one of the saddest days of my life. I'd been a believer now at this point for about five years. And one of the great honors of my life was coupled with one of the great sadnesses of my life. The sadness was that this man that I had known as an oak, he, his name was not only oak, short for Oakley. My, my younger brother bears that as his middle name. I bear his first name, Charles, David Charles Ashrick, Charles Oakley Atkins. But everybody just called him oak because he was like a tree. He was a mighty, wonderful, kind, compassionate person. Not what I would call an outright Christian, but somebody who certainly had an appreciation for the message of Christianity and the message of kindness and selflessness and, and just living the right way. He was an old-fashioned person, an old-fashioned farmer that did life the right way. And years later, after I would be married, my wife and I, we would travel to Cheyenne, Wyoming every time we would pass anywhere near, and we would spend time with Rita and Oak, and we would sing to them. I had my guitar, and we would sing, and without exception, my grandfather would say, Sing Amazing Grace. And every time we would sing that song, the tears would just come out of his eyes. He was never a strongly religious man, didn't go to church. I think he just, I think he couldn't put up with all the old ladies, right? He just, he was a quiet man. He was a simple man. He was a humble man. But when my wife and I would sing Amazing Grace, tears would come out of his eyes. And I received the call that my grandfather had passed away. The oak had fallen. And I was asked by his children, my mom and my uncles, my two uncles, Dana and Doug, if I would perform the funeral. And I said I would. And I wrote that sermon. I wrote it word for word because I wanted to be very careful that I said everything exactly like I wanted it to be said. It's not every day that you get to deliver the homily at the funeral for the man that you think is one of the best men that ever walked the earth. And uh, it was one of the great honors of my life. And a remarkable thing happened. It was small. My grandfather lived to be almost 90 years old, and so most of his friends had passed away long before him. His wife was still alive, Rita. She lived another four years, unfortunately stricken by Alzheimer's, which is a terrible disease because in, in, in Alzheimer's, your loved one really dies twice. And uh, they die the f when they don't know who you are, they don't know who they are. There's a, that, that person that you knew, that you loved, that you grew up with, that person is gone. And then the day comes when their body actually is gone, too. It's very painful. It's a very difficult thing. But grandmother was still alive, and she was alive enough to understand that, that Oak had passed away. But the edge of the pain was numb somewhat by her already um, beginning, the beginnings of Alzheimer's. 
And it was a small funeral home there, small chapel. And uh, there was about 50 people in attendance, including most of the people that I knew. But there were a smattering of people that I didn't know, old friends and a few younger faces that I didn't know. And it was an open casket funeral in a very small little chapel that would have been not much larger than this stage. And, and uh, as people came to leave, they would, they would shake my hand as the minister, the officiating minister, and they would walk by Oak's casket. They would shake my hand and walk by Oak's casket. Shake my hand and walk by Oak's casket. After the funeral was done, we got in the hearse to go over to the cemetery, and my mother said to me, did you see Frank? And I said, what? I don't know who Frank is. She said, your, your, your father, your biological father, Frank, was there. He was sitting in the second row wearing the red sweater. You shook his hand. I have shaken my biological father's hand and still never met him. Let me tell you something. There is a God in heaven that loves you, would never abandon you, would never forsake you, would never leave you. He is your heavenly father. And for those of you that were privileged enough to have great dads that maybe gave you a little glimpse into the paternal love of your heavenly father, you should praise Jesus every day for that dad you got. And for those of you who perhaps like myself didn't, not until later in life or perhaps never, I meet too many young people, girls and boys, for whom mom was there but dad was absent, right? I'm a bit of a sports fan, not a huge sports fan, but it's fascinating. In, in all, so many of these young athletes, the story is the same. Mom was there, dad was gone. Mom was there, dad was gone. Mom was there, dad was gone. And I decided in my life, when our, my two boys were born, oh, I'm done. <laughs> I decided when, I, when, when, I, when my two boys were born that that cycle of absentee father, that was going to be broken. And I said, I, I don't know what else I'm going to be. When, the, when, when, when all is said and done and when the dust is settled and when David Asherick ends up in his grave, I want them to be able to say at least... He was a great dad. He was a great father. And uh, I just want you to know, you have a great dad. You have a great father, your heavenly father who loves you dearly. I don't know the circumstance and situation of your earthly father, your earthly situation. But you can be not only born again. Scripture says you can be adopted. And when the spirit of adoption comes into your life, it cries out, dad. Thank you so much. All right, we uh, will have about a 15-minute break, and then 11 o'clock we'll start.